Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Marika van der Steenhoven. I'm the Special Collections Education and Engagement Librarian here at the Bowdoin College Library. I'm joining you today from our reading room, which is on the third floor of the Hawthorne Longfellow Library here on Bowdoin's campus in Brunswick, Maine. I'm delighted to see all of you, some friends and new faces um, in our participant list. Um, this is our last page turning, obviously, of 2021. Um, we're going to be commencing the series yet again in February of 2022. The college will be um, on break in January, and so we'll commence um, with the birds and the page turnings in February. Um, Thanks again to all of you joining. Um, we've got folks coming from Hope, Maine, um, the biology department here on campus. Um, please feel free to join in the chat. I will recommend that you um, select the drop down menu and choose everyone so we can all see your comments. Um, we will be facilitating a Q&A with our guest um, after um, her talk uh, via the chat. So feel free to drop your questions in there throughout the program. So um, I'm joined today in uh, the reading room by Kat Stefko, our department um, director, and we are going to flip the bird and then I'm going to introduce our guest speaker to you. So I'm going to switch the camera back over and we're going to say goodbye to the great horned owl who it seems like has been with us not long enough thank you cat okay so you'll see my face with just a minute <laughs> while I introduce. Well, actually, let's keep it on the bird. Um, our guest today, who I'm so delighted is joining us, is Pro Susan E. Wegner, Associate Professor of Art History, Chair of the Department of Art, and Director of Art History of the Art History Division. Professor Wagner's research interests include Italian 16th and 17th century art and science, Italian drawings, arts in Peru, and 19th century American arts, especially Renaissance revivals and natural history images. In 2014, Professor Wagner curated a monumental exhibition for the library, Envisioning Extinctions, Art as Witness and Conscience, which commemorated the centenary anniversary of the extinction of the passenger pigeon, which is the bird that we've turned to today. Professor Wagner previously joined us as a guest for our May 2017 page turning when we turned to the Carolina pigeon, another extinct bird. And we are so delighted to welcome her back. Hello, Professor Wagner. Hi, thanks, Marika. And thanks to Kat. I'm grateful you two are such great stewards of these treasures. And I wanted to say thank you to um, Roscoe H. Hupper, who brought this book to Bowdoin in memory of his mother, Mary Alden Hupper. Thank you. I'm delighted to be back here again. I'm delighted to be speaking with no mask on. And I'm going to be brief because I want to hear people's comments and questions. There are three things I'd like to cover. The bird itself, a few comments about the bird, the picture, the painting of the print based on Audubon's drawing. And then lastly, Maine, Brunswick, Bowdoin. What's the connection with this remarkable bird? This is one of my favorite birds and I just regret I missed seeing it by only 40 years. If only I had been here earlier, but I missed seeing it. it um, I should say something about its name, passenger pigeon. It's better to call it, I think, wild pigeon or speak of it by its Latin name, Ectopistus migratorius. The passenger gets people confused. It is not a domesticated pigeon. It is not a carrier pigeon. Um, it is not a homing pigeon. It is a completely wild pigeon 
and the passenger comes from a not very good translation from the French, passager, so um, a wandering pigeon, um, a moving pigeon. So just as long as you know it's wild and um, never carried messages, but it carries a message for us today. It's a remarkable creature. I have just great admiration for it. It's beautiful, as you can see, the, the male had a slate gray back with um, black markings and then an iridescent throat and into the chest of red and gleaming purples and greens. The female was a little bit blander, but still some beautiful subtle hints of powder blue on her plumage. So it must have been just wonderful to see these birds. And they were prolific. They, low estimates of their population, three billion, three billion birds. Hard to imagine. If you've ever seen those videos of murmurations of starlings, I think they have some from England, where these great clouds of birds are swooping around. Try to think of that as multiplied by hundreds. And that's what it would be like to see millions of birds moving through the sky, going to their roosts or searching for food. And it's still hard for me to get my mind around that. And they're also an ancient bird. They were here already in the Pliocene. So they had millions of years of life. Um, before they were extinguished, because they were so numerous, because there were these gigantic roostings and gigantic flocks that would darken the sky for hours, if not days, people thought, oh, they're, there's so many of them, we could never exhaust them. Well, we did. We ate them. We shot them. We destroyed their food. We destroyed their nesting places. We hunted them relentlessly all throughout the year. And some technological advances helped that along. The telegraph could tell people, oh yeah, there's a big roost happening in Pittsburgh. So all the market hunters could go there. And then the laying of train tracks allowed shipping. So even before refrigeration, you could ship barrels and barrels and barrels of these birds to St. Louis or to New York, and then people could dine on them uh, the next evening. So they are gone. Um, and that's a loss, uh, not just for bird watchers, but they left a gap in the whole landscape of North America. And these birds were spread from Canada to Texas and Mississippi and most of the eastern half of the United States as it exists now, they, um, they were remarkable. So in any case, it, it warms my heart to think of they were here. They were here in Maine some of the old growth forests or that 200 year old tree that sits by Harriet Beecher Stowe's house, birds could have sat in that. Wild passenger pigeons could have roosted in that. Wild passenger pigeons could have eaten some acorns from those oaks. So we can't have them alive, but we can have a lot of knowledge that's been gathered over the century of their demise. Um, they never were studied in the wild. They were studied in some captive flocks, but that's pretty meager when you consider there were 3 billion of them. I'd like to turn to Audubon's image. He did a drawing. He prepared a colored painting when he was in Pittsburgh. He just had a horrible debacle of talking to the scientists of Philadelphia. That didn't work out at all, but he found some friendly people in Pittsburgh that he stayed with for a couple of weeks, and he drew this pair of passenger pigeons that are uh, recorded in the print and then hand colored by 
uh, probably women. So what does it show us? It shows us a male perching on a lichen decorated bow and the female on a delicate bow above him with a few dry leaves on it. And they're billing, they're putting their beaks together. The female has her bill inside of the male's open bill. And Audubon describes what he thinks is going on in this. He's a little inaccurate, but um, pretty good. The birds would be very affectionate during mating and they would usually be sitting side by side. They wouldn't be one above the other like this. And they would um, bring their bills together. They would coo to each other. This kind of posture of one bird above another is really more suited to an adult feeding a chick feeding a nestling, feeding a squab. But this male definitely is not a squab. That's a full grown male with all of his colors and his magnificent tail feathers and pointy wings. So it's a little bit wrong, but the, the birds would feed their nestlings for the first couple days, maybe a week with milk, pigeon milk. They produced this curd in their crops and it was very digestible. It wasn't some harsh acorn or spiky caterpillar or something, but they could just give this milk to their young fledglings. And then after a while, they could bring them worms or some other things to eat. But that, that's a curious thing. I think all pigeons have that ability to generate this milk in their crops. So, what else about this painting? It's um, emotional, dramatic. It's not showing the birds hunting for food or nesting. It's showing this pair bond. And we know from accounts that the birds, when they're coming to their mating time, they would pair off pretty quickly. You'd have pairs that would establish their place on a stick and then build some crummy little nest out of a few more sticks. And they'd be pretty peaceful with, with each other. Once they had established their place, there would be hundreds of nests in a single tree. So it's good that they were pacifists and they weren't squabbling with one another. They had these very random nests or very open net-like nests. And probably it would help the eggs to stay cool, maybe one egg, maybe two eggs. Um, but it doesn't seem very sturdy when you compare it to what an eagle builds or what an osprey builds, tons of material. So, um, but I like this, this kiss, kiss of the birds. Um, there are more things to say about the drawing and the print, but I think I'll just switch now to Maine. I said that the birds were here and the birds are recorded. We know from the native peoples who are here, you may be familiar with what is called Micmac, the Micmac people. I've looked at the pronunciations that are presented now by um, the tribes and they say it's more like uh, Mi'kmaq. So you can look up the pronunciations. We need to work a lot on our understanding of the Wabanaki languages. But in any case, they were in legends of the peoples and one of the best ones is the seven bird hunters and the bear, Muin. So the bear is being hunted by these seven bird hunters and they're placed in the sky. They're the handle of the Big Dipper and some stars that go beyond the handle. And then the bear is in the body of the, the cup of the Dipper. So you can see them chasing the bear. If you watch the entire sky turn around Polaris, you'll see the chase of the seven bird hunters. Well, um, coming closer to our time, Bowdoin College, when it is founded, it's uh, sort of this upstart. It's going to be calling itself the Harvard of the North. 
but people who were kind of poking fun at it and laughing at it said, oh, that's Blueberry College, because it was going to be built on these blueberry fields, the sandy blueberry plain. And if they really wanted to be insulting, they'd say, oh, that's Pigeon College, because the only beings that were coming to that region were pigeons coming, the passenger pigeons coming to eat the blueberries. Well, the college thrived anyhow. And then we have some remarkable graduates of Bowdoin who talk about the birds, uh, starting with that remarkable class of 1825 with Longfellow and Hawthorne. The boys would go out hunting before chapel and they would be shooting passenger pigeons in the woods around the college. Henry did not hunt. His brother Stephen liked to hunt, but Henry did not hunt. He would just go out and look at the animals, look at the creatures, and he called these birds of passage. So he was a very sensitive young soul and left all the hunting and devouring to Hawthorne and his brother and any freshman that they could lure up when they're cooking their pigeon pies. There um, are later graduates. Joshua Chamberlain talks about his experience when he's a boy in Brewer and he sees the pigeons gathering at night and the setting sun is shining on their red breasts and he's just in awe of them. And he would sometimes take his gun out into the fields pretending that he was going hunting, but he wasn't. He was like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He was going out to look at the things around him, to see the beings around him. Then a forgotten person from 1868 class is Charles Otis Whitman. He's a biologist. He went to Leipzig to get his higher degrees and ended up teaching in Chicago. The University of Chicago lured him there. He had the last captive flock of passenger pigeons. He was very interested in pigeons and he collected a whole bunch of them, but he had maybe a dozen or so over the years and he studied them quite closely. Some of the main photographs we have of the passenger pigeon are photographs of his flock. There are very few other photographs of the animals. And he was, uh, he was a big wig. He would take all of his birds with him every summer to this new place he was founding on the coast, the um, Institute for Biology at Woods Hole. So he was one of the beginning scientists there, but he'd have to have his birds along, so he'd bring them in a railroad car. He did give his um, a female bird to a zoo at one point, the Cincinnati Zoo. I guess he had too many females. And that may be the last known living passenger pigeon with a name of Martha. And she lived until 1914. So that was the end. That was the end of this entire species. That was the end of three billion birds. And it's hard to imagine, it's hard to imagine that. But I ask you to imagine another 3 billion birds, and those are the 3 billion that have gone since birds were being counted in North America in 1972. There are 3 billion fewer birds now countable. And some of the birds that are really struggling are things like the bobolink, a really fine grassland bird that nests in hay fields. But it's the same old story, habitat destruction, disruption of nesting, um, lack of food with a lot of agricultural practices. Insects get poisoned off and there's nothing for birds to eat or to feed their nestlings. So let's not repeat what was happening in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. We have an opportunity to be better stewards of our landscape and our fellow creatures. So I leave you with that charge, do that work. Thanks for listening. 
Susan, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. You brought us uh, such a rich um, perspective of these passenger pigeons. And for those who hadn't have not yet looked into the chat, I would encourage you to um, spend some time with the digitized version of the exhibition that Professor Wegner curated in 2014 um, during that the hundredth anniversary or commemoration of the extinction of the passenger pigeon. Uh, Shana Stewart Deeds um, from the biology department um, adds on to your call for us to um, also um, acknowledge um, and our mowing practices and um, the, the fewer grasslands impact um, the, bo the boba lynx as well. So if you have a question, please pop that into um, the chat and we'd be happy to answer your question. Um, I will get us started. Uh, Professor Wegner, I'm curious as to how you came, um, your passion for the passenger pigeon is undeniable. And I'm curious how you came, how you came to discover or develop this passion. Well, I grew up in Wisconsin on a dairy farm and you'd get up early in the morning before the sun and do your chores and feed the calves and stand outside in the freezing cold. And there wasn't much to look at except the sky and birds. So I got to see the great birds that were around my parents' farm, yellow-headed blackbirds and other great birds. And then I quickly found out from Wisconsin history that that had been one of the last great nestings recorded of the passenger pigeon in Wisconsin. And some of these nestings could string out for over a hundred miles. They, they're just unimaginable. And they, um, they would change the landscape. If you have a million or so birds nesting, you can imagine that they'd enrich the soil beneath the trees, which is good for farmers. And they'd also kill off the trees that they break branches all the time. And it would just be a denuded stretch of wood when they're done with it. And then they'd go and nest somewhere else next season. So the birds contributed to agriculture. I'm sure people shot them and ate them in Wisconsin, but I had heard of them quite quickly as a young person mm -hmm. and the story of their extinction. Oh, well, that's so fascinating thinking about then the connection um, from Wisconsin and, and all of the amazing documentation of the birds here on campus. I would encourage those who are interested, come visit us in the archives and we can connect you with some of those primary source documents that, um, that discuss those passenger pigeons here on campus. Um, one of the most Oh, it was it, it is stuck with me to this day um, from from your exhibition was the the image or the recollection of um, the sun um, being covered by those mm -hmm. millions of birds that was really magnificent. We have a question here um, from Lisa Hibble, who is a, a has joined us as a guest um, and is a Bowdoin alum, uh, who asks, where do you look for inspiration? or optimism as someone who has been so involved with the creation of an exhibit um, envisioning extinctions? Where do I look for inspiration? Well, I look to the library's special collections. What a treasure house. Go there and look through all of the illustrated volumes, not just of birds, but Audubon did mammals. And there are plenty of great things from Kate Furbish, all the plants that she drew. I also, I'm out in nature quite a bit. I go out and visit one of the sanctuaries at Bay Bridge Landing. It's just a couple miles here from the college and it's got the river, the Androscoggin, it's got marshes, it's got deciduous trees, it's got um, pines and it's, it's filled with birds in every season. There are resident bald eagles, now we're getting all these wonderful winter water birds, golden eyes, buffle heads, things like that. And just look, take, we have to take our eyes off our little phones and look at the other beings with whom we share this space and not get so focused on Facebook and, <laughs> and 
we miss too much. We just miss too much. So walk through the Bowdoin Pines. I'd say that's where you can get some good inspiration. Thanks for asking. Give it just a moment. Linda Doherty, um, a retired Bowdoin professor in art history, says, fascinating talk, Susan, especially the part about the milk production. Do you have any thoughts about the setting Audubon uses for the passenger pigeon? Is it purely aesthetic? Did he admire the passenger pigeon or just take it for granted? And was the female smaller than the male as she appears here? Um, I'll start with the last first. Yes, the female is a little bit smaller than the male. I think the distortion of the camera makes mm. him look gigantic and her look a little too puny. But yes, um, they were different. The males and females were different. The, hmm, the aesthetic, he, uh, Audubon is a very sensitive creator of these poetic presentations of his birds. So he has those dry dead leaves. It looks kind of elmish to me, but the birds would take any tree for their nesting time. And this is a, a mating scene. So they would take anything and it would break off. Um, I love the lichens. I just love the lichens. And then that curve under the female, I think that Audubon is looking to a very ancient image of pigeons that was quite popular in the 19th century as a souvenir from the Grand Tour. If you went to Rome, it was the fashion to get these little miniature mosaics that you could have as a pin or um, a little box. And one of them that was quite popular was a reproduction of so-called Pliny's doves a Roman mosaic that showed doves perching on the rim of a golden bowl and dipping their beaks into the water. And that's where the female comes from. She is a twin of the dove from that ancient Roman mosaic who stands on the edge of a curved bowl and dips down into the water to get a drink. So yeah, he had a lot of inspirations He's, he's a fascinating artist. So did that answer your question or did you have something else in mind? That, just waiting to see if anything else pops up. Kat, Kat and um, Marika, may I say something back to Shanna? Oh, please. About bottlings. That is exactly right about the mowing. If you want to see bobolinks in the summer, go to Pennellville, the great grass fields on either side of the Pennellville roads. And it'll take a while for the mowers to come through, but before they do, you'll see bobolinks flying around, sitting on the wires, singing their bobolink song. And um, they're like bumblebees. They mm -hmm. look like giant bumblebees flying around. So see them now, see these birds now. The bobolinks are one of the birds going really down in numbers. Mm -hmm. So see them while they're here. Thanks. Again, thank you so much. I um, Your call for us to spend both time with um, these beautiful historical documents that we house and welcome people to come visit here in special collections, plus going outside and spending time in nature and slowing down and making observations, I think is such a such an important um, call to action for us to all listen to. And I thank you so much um, for your time and your thoughtful comments on the passenger pigeons today, Professor Wagner. This was just such a pleasure and um, something to carry us through um, with that charge uh, to uh, the next year. So many, many thanks are being thrown up in the chat. I wanna thank again, Professor Wagner, thank you so much for joining us. And to all of our attendees coming from all over, um, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in 2022. Um, it will 
still, I know, I, I can't quite wrap my head around that. It is still be to be determined um, whether we will be convening here in the reading room again, but please note that we will continue to stream these events um, live because we've we've established such an incredible um, broad um, community that we wanna keep you all involved. Um, so thank you again and uh, be well everyone and we'll see you in February, 2022. Thanks for the opportunity. That's terrific. Bye.